So good afternoon. What a gorgeous day. And even better because we're here to listen to poetry, right? All right. Um, so I'm Giovanni Singleton. I'm Lunch Poems Coordinator. Thank you all for being here. Um, first, I'd like to invite you to sign up on our email list, which is kept over on the um, librarian's desk. We also have uh, posters outlining the full year's programming, so please feel free to pick one up. Also, um, if you want to review this reading, as we know you all will, and share it with your friends, um, we post the videos about two weeks after the live event on our very own YouTube channel. So please log on and check it out. Um, next month, we celebrate National Poetry Month with former Poet Laureate of San Francisco, Devorah Major. So please be sure and come back on uh, April 6th um, for that special event. In the meantime, today, presently, um, Please welcome uh, incoming Director of Lunch Poems, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce this afternoon's really special guest. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. We're really pleased to have Jennifer here today. I want to start by quoting a really innocent seeming moment from a poem called Island of Opposites. Unconscious wish wishes that nothing harder oppose us than time. The tracing paper has yellowed to a shade I'm fond of, just as I am of those silly magic markers. You probably didn't hear in that the rhyme of time with I'm. And if you were looking at the paper, you'd certainly see it. Um, but I think it's a really crucial moment for thinking about how Jennifer handles rhyme. Um, she wants to use ancient verse capacities, but she wants to turn them to non-nostalgic contemporary ends. And she wants to make sure that she moves quotidian speech towards the condition of formalized poetic utterance, while also moving the, the, the poetics of the poems back towards casualness. Does I am rhyme with time? Yes, and it also doesn't, if you unpack it to I am, which the next line does. It's kind of also, therefore, a question about time, about how much time you need to see and hear a rhyme, and whether it's over too soon, whether it even happened. Perhaps that's why the shade of paper that the speaker enjoys has yellowed, and why the term for color there, shade, is also a term we use for ghost. Um, so rhyme has fatal, mortal stakes for this poet. All that is happening in a long literary moment where we're almost entirely embarrassed of rhyme. Um, I suppose that goes back at least as far as Milton's distrust of the jingling of like ends, but we really are in a moment that's almost free of rhyme. But Jennifer really, is insistent upon disembarrassing rhyme. She's counter to that embarrassment. And Island of Opposites, her second book is called um, Counter Amores. Uh, I think Jennifer wants to make the opposite apposite. She wants to find a way to rhyme the past of poetry with its present purposes. You can even hear in Counter Amores the two languages jostling, right? It's not Contra Amores, it's Counter Amores. And that book is a set of revisions of Ovid's poems, making them full of the sort of detritus and references of the contemporary. I think I would say that that ultimately makes Clairvaux pretty Eliotic, right? She's somebody who wants to make sure that we lose nothing of the past, but that we never simply inertly replicate it. It always has to do new work, even if it's familiar and old and ancient. And let's hear some of that right now, even if we can't see the rhymes on the page and may miss some of them as they're spoken. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Jeffrey and Giovanni and Bob Haas for uh, running this series and inviting me to participate. Um, I can't say what a pleasure it is for me to be here. Again, I was a graduate student here uh, in the dark, backward, and abysm of time. Um, and I, I really haven't been back, uh, haven't been back in this area. And planning this reading gave me a chance to rethink 
how special my years as a graduate student were for me here uh, and how much uh, they've informed uh, things that I wrote, uh, uh, things that I've written since that time. Uh, my first book, Invisible Tender, about half the poems were written while I was here. Uh, and, but the Berkeley poems in it were really written once I left. <laughs> Uh, and um, again, putting this, orchestrating what I wanted to read for you today, I realized how much of uh, the Berkeley reading and the Berkeley learning and the wonderful teachers I had here has keeps percolating through uh, uh, the rest of the work. So uh, I, I think rhymes are always there. <laughs> echoes are, are always there, uh, testing uh, the connection to the past and testing what persists into the present. And, and I got to say, you know, right now, if you're not supposed to warn, uh, they tell, they're, you're, not, you're not supposed to rhyme. They warn you against it. Nevertheless, I persisted. So, um, in, when, when I was a graduate student here, there was a wonderful reading series that uh, gave students the opportunity to read with uh, established writers. And in 1984, I read in the Maud Fife Room with Josephine Miles. So I want to start uh, by reading one of her poems. Um, and then I'll read a few poems, uh, a few poems from each of my books and some new ones since then. Uh, the, the poem that I'd like to read uh, is probably one of her most well-known poems called Family uh, from her 1974 volume, To All Appearances. Family. When you swim in the surf off seal rocks, and your family sits in the sand eating potato salad, and the undertow comes which takes you out, away, down, to loss of breath, loss of play, and the power of play. Holler, say, help, help, help. Hello, they will say. Come back here for some potato salad. It is then that a 17-year-old cub cruising in a helicopter from Antigua, a jackstraw expert speaking only Swedish and remote from this area as a camel, says, look down there. There is somebody drowning. And it is you. You say, yes, yes and he throws you a line. This is what is called the brotherhood of man. It's a good line to be thrown. This is what is called the brotherhood of man. So I've been thinking about this poem this morning and the act that it makes in throwing out a line. And I think that that's a poetic gesture as much as it is a social uh, gesture, and, and I think in some ways uh, that's behind uh, the basic impulse for me in writing poems, testing uh, a connection, asking for a connection. I say help, you say hello, come here, have some potato salad. I say help, help, help. Help rhymes with help. But uh, uh, So I thought I'd read the first poem is a Berkeley poem in which uh, a neighbor uh, extends a hand over a fence to me. It seems to me this echoes, I don't know, it echoes the come have some potato salad. That's one kind of line. Um, other things as well. So uh, I wrote this after I left Berkeley, I carried with me a little Berkeley history 
book um, that had information about how everything in Berkeley arrived here, flora, fauna, trades, practices, and some of that research went into it. I also took with me a column I'd clipped out of the San Francisco Chronicle with the names of a long list of endangered species, wildflowers, thinking I, I need this list, um, I'll use it sometime. Um, and then when I was writing the poem, I suddenly thought, I, I need this list here. Uh, and much more miraculously, I found it in my files. So um, This is called Ruth's, Ruth's Garden. That's my neighbor, Ruth. The Spanish brought the trumpet-shaped petunia and lemons from the Andes. 1910 saw eucalyptus and wisteria. Montbrizia shoots up lush at winter's zenith. Under the fuchsia bells, hummingbirds hover and dangle like fishing lures. My neighbor offers over her side yard fence an enormous bunch of spinach, trailing its sturdy, dirt-crumbed root. Take these. I just let them all go old. And then when I thank her, it's really no big deal. But I have to think I haven't heard her right when she lets drop in vitro fertilization. Surely she's talking technology for her garden, for the tiny pear baby yellow and red tomatoes, the plum and beef steak jostling to bursting the paper sack that she left on my doorstep. This year, she's trained the tomatoes over a frame. But no, she says she's been looking at pictures of triplets, which happen sometimes, looking at pictures of twins. Casually, as she restakes the little front fence protecting her wildflowers, she says only one in four works out at all. It's always seemed to me she could grow anything. In the fairy tale, the wife's craving sends her husband over the wall to plunder the witch's garden. And in the myth, the young girl secretly cradles in her cheek some five forbidden pomegranate seeds. And in the pregnant dream, her water breaks on a pool table. So she starts to drive herself to the hospital, veers into a field, and feet on either side of the steering wheel, gives birth to a boy as constellations glide and whirl over the dashboard, silver and black and red, a kaleidoscopic zodiac. Crouching in her garden, her fingers rake and soften the dirt. Thistle and meadow foam, lupin, thornment, butterweed and lily are all endangered, as are checker bloom and live forever, I think, as I discover dark, sugary trails where I've clutched the root to my shirt. And uh, this next uh, Berkeley poem has another kind of uh, leftover from the time I was here. The summer before I uh, started graduate school, I took a UC Extension workshop, and Bob Haas gave an assignment. Think of a time you learned from grief. Think of a time you learned from joy. Well, my high school English teacher's name was Joy. <laughs> and uh, at the time, and she taught me all kinds of things. She's a wonderful poet. At the time uh, of the giving of that assignment, I could do nothing with it. I was blocked by the sort of joke or the coincidence or the too absolute rhyme of joy with joy as a teacher. And uh, some years later in Ohio, uh, I was, uh, actually I was getting ready to host a reading, I think it was, but I, I got a phone call uh, from Joy and um, her husband, uh, uh, I had always called him Mr. Pregnall, uh, the very reverend William S. Pregnall, but we were at a stage where I was supposed to call them by their first names, and I suddenly thought, Joy's married to Will. 
I thought, when I was on the phone. And I thought, oh, oh, here's, so here's my poem. And, and then uh, when I was a graduate student here, uh, Will was the dean of the Divinity School of the Pacific, and I cleaned house for them. Uh, and I was uh, uh, thinking about them and thinking about the assignment, and again, wrote, wrote this poem uh, years later in Ohio. There's a, a, a reference in this poem to a bomb going off on the other coast. Uh, this was uh, in the early 80s, a bomb in, the, uh, in some rooms in the Capitol building in DC. I grew up in DC and my father worked for the government, so um, the connections aren't really clear in the poem by itself in a way they might be in the rest of the book, but I'll mention that. So this poem is called Household Prayer. When I cleaned house for joy across from the Golden Gate, when I cleaned house for Will on Holy Hill, it was the house I wanted, the only house for me, and Will was religion, and joy was poetry, top-heavy roses, olive tree arcade, and the light was gold dust clear, like a new Vermeer. I mopped the kitchen floor, dusted the glass-topped box, and rows on rows of books, removed each chair from the pale, pale blue carpet, so the path the vacuum made was smooth as meditation. Life in that household was grace. What could there be for me to clean in such a place? Then a window pane relinquished a gray film to a dust cloth, and glass in every room let go such gray, I felt the smudge was me, but came to see that joy left smoke on the bedroom vanity. And why shouldn't joy smoke, for heaven's sake? I couldn't tell what was left after Will had done his work. I wonder still. Then, on the day the bomb went off on the other coast in empty rooms, I stopped and wrote the first draft of a poem there in Poetry's house, but not in Joy's chair upstairs with the slow continuing sea view but at the sermon typewriter downstairs in choppy strokes, a poem I still redo, a poem for my father against time, as if an act of will performed there in that house, like clearing glass, like lifting dust, a simple repeating gesture like a rhyme, without having to try to save the past, could marry joy, could really hold and last. And I think maybe one, one more uh, from this book. Uh, this is called Echolocation, uh, The Whale. And it, uh, I was reading the book of Jonah um, maybe I want to read this one because it's like, it's like the uh, Josephine Miles poem, um, what happens when you get uh, thrown out into the undertow, loss of breath, loss of play. Maybe a poem has to go there and then figure out the extent to which it's possible or not to come back. Anyway, echolocation, the whale. This is not in Berkeley. In Jonah's nightmare, everybody cries or rages or cries out against some rage or sins unthinking. Oh, what meanest thou, cry the sailors when they find him in the hold asleep. What meanest thou, arise and call upon thy God. I saw you in the womb, that much seems certain, or I saw a ghost baby sucking its ghost thumb in the gray newsreel from some future moon so far the light wears out in breathing itself back to us. It's hard to read. The forms emerge 
flickering in cross sections of motion. The only thing we're sure of is the heart, its constant pulse, and then the empty space of the skull. If reason wants to take us into Jonah's rage, some way into the slow accumulating cry he cried by reason of his own sore affliction, into waters that compassed him about even to the soul, into the depth that closed him round about and thick into the lash and clutch of weeds, then where do we find ourselves but sinking, sinking? Reason, water, depth, and weeds. My soul fainted within me. When I hear the shrieks of the child, my child, and then the deeper voice, a father's voice in anger, is it his, zeroing in on me from down the street? It's glorious to realize they're not mine, a greedy relief. At least it is at first, but they keep on, and then I have to see and crack the blind. The father leads, head down, as if to batter a wall. Shut up, shut up. Each time he just can't hold it, he lets loose. Shut up. The child, about a leash length back, a jerked leash, howls obliteration, howls and dawdles miserably. I know this dance, mundane, bitter, and intimate. Shut up. As if some weed or tentacle has yanked him round, the father lunges at the child and yells, but it's too funny. What he yells this time is donuts, hauling the hoarded sweet deep from the clutched sack. Donuts, but the child still blots the world with howls. God damn it, take them. Shut up, you're driving me fucking nuts. I've let the blind fall long since. Jonah dreams a God who wants to hold him and sing lullabies, as if sweet reason comforted enough, as if our feeble reasons comfort you, as if our knowing you should comfort us. So Jonah's God then spake unto the fish. It vomits Jonah out upon dry land. Okay, change of location. Uh, I got a prize, I went to Rome. Uh, and I had been writing poems back to Ovid's Amores, as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, and those poems changed because I got to be there. So I'm gonna read you uh, one poem from this series, Counter Amores. The, in the first of, of his Amores, Ovid says, uh, I wanted to write an epic. I had prepared appropriate measures for uh, writing an epic, but Cupid came and stole a foot away, uh, and so I had to write love poems. Um, uh, and, and he's partly making a joke about different meters for these things. But I went to Rome, and it was the year that the Iraq War started. Uh, and that was the opposite, <laughs> in a way, of what happened to Ovid. So I, I wanted to find a way to talk about it and to think um, in serious terms about this joke of having a measure stolen from you. What would it mean to be prepared to write one thing and, and have something else written? And, and, and what that meant uh, was that phrases and sounds and words that I was hearing gravitated towards being about the war, whether I wanted them uh, to do that or not. So, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, ciao bella um, is, is something that you will hear said, but bella ciao, the opposite of that, is the name of a protest song that was sung in the peace march in Rome in the February uh, before the war. Um, turning the phrase from a kind of a happy greeting to uh, a, a mournful, almost uh, dirge-like song. And, and likewise, even uh, that term, bella, uh, in, in the Aeneid, when Aeneas goes to the underworld 
and the Sybil talks to him about what's in the future, she says, bella, orida bella, wars, terrible wars. And, you know, I, I was there. We'd gone to the caves at Kuma. They'd put the pages in front of me and I'd read them. So I'd had Bella resonating in my mouth in that way. So for me, I tried to write something that would, uh, again, take seriously um, this twist uh, that Ovid uh, offered us. And um, maybe that's enough um, to tell you now. Um, I'm calling it Arms About You. The bells rang la bella vita into the Roman air, and all I wanted was a room somewhere to fall in love and write about it lightly. Now, ciao bella modulates to bella ciao, a sweet and bitter tune to move this march along, while bella Horida Bella weights the song down, more heavily down. How the bells clamor shocks and awes the air like hammering armor ringing in the ear. Sound bites the sense away, bites the ear that heeds it, sees the day bitten down to the quick, down to the clenched jaw that knows there is another use for awe. And I was sick with love for the bark of the sycamore, layers stripping back to some live core, like an Ovid in reverse, the girl trapped in the tree, struggling for release, simultaneously chased, grasped, and unclasped, torn and untorn. To see into that bark was to be reborn into another world, to see the name Amor, written into the heart of the sycamore. But now, the mottled ivory, dove gray, olive gray, is given back to me a different way, as military camouflage. And I can't make the war give me back myself or the sycamore. I think that's all I'm going to read from this book. I want to read new, some new poems, very new poems. Um, so uh, this is a poem. It's a poem in stanzas. The stanza is borrowed from the stanza for Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, um, which winds up uh, in the poem itself. Stanza means room, and there is a kind of movement from one room to another, from stanza to stanza. So I'm not entirely sure this is clear. I'll say that the first room is a doctor's office. In the second stanza, we go back in time to a room at a literary conference about flat and rounded characters, and then the third room is a classroom where people are discussing Ode on a Grecian Urn. And that also, that returns to the day of the first room. So doctor's office, flashback to conference classroom. Um, and this is called uh, Ode on a Fibroid Infarction. <laughs> he said, oh look, I can see the baby's head. But what was there? I couldn't read the screen. Was I pregnant? Was the baby dead, hence the blood? Or maybe he didn't mean that's what he saw, and it was just a joke. What kind of doctor makes a joke like that, careless to the point of cruelty, airs whatever pops into his head without thinking it through? And then what woke in me that moment, struggling not to be faced or expressed. No baby, I was sure. Pain, days earlier, during the keynote speech on flat and rounded characters, made me reach for something I heard but didn't fully hear. What isn't rounded isn't fully real, and yet, so often it's peripheral comic characters holding up the lamps, affording us a sudden piercing glimpse into the life of things. 
How could the doctor see with ultrasound what was mattering in me? And oh, my happy students, later that same day, happily reading Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn, while I kept inside me what I couldn't say and didn't think was time for them to learn. Three flies buzz, persistent, around the table, making our thoughts zigzag as the clock ticks louder, their little motors amplified. There is no silence, no unravished bride, no foster child of quiet. The poem sticks in the throat, half-voiced, and I'm unable to banish the image that now superimposes itself on the Grecian urn, taut uterus with tubes and attendant ovaries. Who chooses what comes into the head? Don't fuss about what the doctor saw. The calcified fibroid forming a perfect skull-shaped dome, size 16 weeks, forever, there inside, what is neither exactly womb nor tomb, a citadel of sorts, but never a soul inhabited that cell, nor leaves it now. I'm full of something I can hardly bear to feel, because what will never happen now seems still happening, like a still life or stillbirth. What if we'd started something, didn't know it grew, until its death was what was there to know? Strobelit bloom imploding, kiln gone cool, I'm trying not to say cold pastoral or think of generations wasting. Earth rockets humming through its fertile fears. Let panic feed the music of the spheres. Oh, blood, oh, clots, oh, cloying stickiness. My long black dress and stockings after class were not worth saving. That's what the flies knew, hovering around, singing their madrigal. Bloody is truth. Truth bloody, that is all we know on earth and all we need to know. Or did you sing body, my little comic chorus, well-rounded, singing of that forthright dimension where truth is always leaking out, is porous, as this polite professor might never happen to mention? What is worth saving? Broken vessel, earth returns to earth. I tell my class each day they live is one day closer to the day they'll die. And when they say, that's morbid, I ask them why and mean it. Every minute, darkling, now here, now gone, our daily orbit, earth's diurnal course. Isn't that true? Keats holds out his living hand, lets go his breath. But, they say, we don't have to dwell on it. And I think, but how to break it to them? We do. I'll do uh, one last poem. Uh, this is, so I'm working on a third Manuscript may be called something like Georgics Against the Cold War. Um, uh, which has to do with, I don't know, valuing broken things and improvatory gestures. And this is a song. A, a lot of things in this manuscript are in song form, and a lot of them are about trash, uh, as if song is a receptacle for what gets uh, thrown away. And then there in the song room, um, something else gets made out of it. So this is called uh, Barrow Ballad. Oh, Harold, oh, Harold. Come trundle your barrow, the world runs away like a wheel. And whatever you see is whatever you saw, and the barrow is full, don't you feel? 
It's breaking, it's broken, I'm taking a token. The world runs wherever it will. And whatever you say is whatever you'll sigh. And the sorrow sinks under the sill. Beloved, believe it. What we have received, it will wind itself down in a whale. And whatever we sought will be covered in soot, and the bills blow away with the mail. My anger, my hunger won't grow any younger. The world wears a stitch in her side. And whatever you sow is whatever you owe, and the harrow comes dragging behind. O Harold, O Harold, come trundle your barrow, the world runs away like a wheel, and whatever you see is whatever you saw, and the barrow is full, don't you feel? It deepens, it darkens, and nobody hearkens. The world tumbles down in the well. Where it mars and it mends, oh, the world never ends. All the store of the stories to tell. Thank you.